Let's talk about freedom this morning. It has been written hundreds of years. In, let's see, what will we go back to? The Probably the beginning. Well, it wouldn't be the beginning then. At, we'll call it Attic Democracy or Attic Freedom. It was pa- practiced by the Grecians, the, the Stoicism, uh, Plato. goes back many, many years. This thought that freedom without discipline cannot survive. I want to repeat that one. Freedom without discipline cannot uh, prosper. It cannot proceed. As a matter of fact, it will fall. It takes discipline to practice a freedom. And we can say that in both the spiritual and the political sense. That is why that God made it adequately understood through his word that the nation, Israel, as well as any nation, was ordained by him or it would not be in business. It would not exist. And in the makeup of those nations, we have many nations that are free and we have many nations that are not free. That is to say, uh, many Americans are kind of spoiled. I, I really don't think Americans know what freedom really is. And especially an American that has never been outside our shores or outside our country. Because you wouldn't know what it was like to have to go down to a local station and ask if you could have a travel permit to go over to see a cousin on the other side or whatever. You wouldn't know what it was like to have to not be able to just do whatever you wanted to, go wherever you wanted to go. In other words, you have the freedom in this country if you want to go to Australia tomorrow. As long as your passport is in order, you're ready to go. You don't have to ask anybody. That's freedom. Freedom to do what you want. Freedom to do what we're doing right now. I had, I received a letter yesterday. It was a sad letter. A letter from Oregon. The person would not sign it. She, she was a nice little lady, apparently. And she said, Arnie, I've listened to you on, t- I don't know why she called me Arnie, but she was very personal not to tell me what her name was. She said, Arnie, America is Babylon. Grow up, smell the flowers, and teach the truth. And I would lay odds that that poor, misguided, wretched soul has never been outside of this country. She's never been among a people that would leave a five-year-old on a, on a mat beside the road and no one stopped to feed it when it was starving and it was sick. Yeah, that was wartime. But that's still hard to realize. Real hard to realize. That because of hunger and because of um, lack of discipline in a government, that it could fall to the point that it could not show compassion on its own people. Look at Somalia recently where the the nations decided to go in because of drug runners. You think drug runners are bad in this country? The real truth was that drug runners, because they all like to chew the lead and would do without food as long as they could get the leaf and let kids die. Let children die and not care. You see, Americans are spoiled, especially when one would call this nation Babylon. I would dare say the person did not even know the meaning of the word Babylon, which is from the prime root Babel, which means confusion, for certainly she was confused. I have been around this world a couple of times. I've seen many things. In the closing months of World War II, I have seen Dutchmen, come aboard a ship and dig coffee grounds from our trash, our garbage cans. I have seen Dutchmen come aboard a ship and wash dishes, dishes to get a little scrap of hot cake or egg or something else from a plate. Wartime? Yeah, yeah. But America has been so blessed that she doesn't even understand what that could be like. Making beggars out of 
people that have dignity. So we have a lot going for us. In this whole hemisphere, our sister nation, Canada, and, and um, as well, whereby we have fields of waving grain. We have more. We are so wasteful. I use enough scrap vegetables in my compost pile to almost feed a family, you know, and, and don't think that much about it because we have plenty. So don't ever take for granted, though, your freedom because freedom cannot flourish without discipline and you do not have discipline in this nation today. That discipline must be in God, of course. That discipline must be in both your political government as well as your spiritual life. We have, if you would, gangs running amok in the larger cities, thinking nothing of gunning down a teenager or an adult or whatever, or drive-by shootings. That's not discipline. And in our schools... Our schools are licensed to do things that that a public business could never do, pass out condoms and give instructions on how to use them. It's done in your school. And no organization could ever do that. But that's what our children are being exposed to. Does it have any merit at all? Well... In some places, I would say yes, probably some merit, but let's don't start with kindergarten, such as our little Arkansas uh, medical leader who will soon be the medical surgeon of uh, our leader in this nation. I've heard her speak more than one time in the state of Arkansas, and she is shocking. Sex education is one thing, but to go beyond decency, to a captive audience. Discipline, now you can talk about anything you want to in school except the morality of God and of his creation. You can talk about atheistic evolution, whereas if evolution were to be a, a fact, anyone with one ounce of common sense knew, would know that it had to be an unending um, evolution. That is to say, you would have present today every aspect of evolution if it were to be a fact. It is not. So, freedom without discipline cannot flourish. And after a period of time, it can't even exist. Why? We must, as a unit, discipline ourselves within the realm of that. Why did God set this up so? Let's take our own government as an example. If I discipline, if we discipline ourselves to operate within the realms of our government, it is forced to protect us in whatever we choose to do in teaching or spreading the good news to the world. They're forced to. That, I could give you an example, I'm, and I'm, in my mind I'm trying to to decide, we received a death threat here, this a severe one this past week, and our government had to move in, the FBI, and they have several men on it right now to protect the uh, our rights and uh, and uh, keep that right open and flourishing. But it is our ability to work with in the legal system of this nation that gives us the freedom to expect its protection, its licensing of our stations, our broadcast, and so on and so forth. So you see, a person of wisdom will always know what is required to truly do the work of God. Otherwise, that person will not be doing the work of God. You know something? Any person of wisdom can t take a, in, an individual and look at his or her priorities. What is the 
highest priority in accomplishing toward, uh, let us say, creative work uh, for, that will be bestowed upon our children or our government or whatever. Show me that person's highest priority, and I will show you that man's mind or that woman's mind. That's what they think about. That is their priority. Therefore, is it the gospel? Is it taxation? Where is your mind? What is important? Trot them out, and I will show you how to read the mind or the heart of that individual. Very simple. I stated a man of wisdom or a woman of wisdom or a child of wisdom has that ability. It's quite simple to tell what a person's mind is by their priorities. So let your priority always be the spreading of the good news because that brings freedom. That not only frees you in this world, but it frees you when you discipline yourself in the word of God to also have eternal life, but most of all, to have God's blessings on what you do. You're not going to be blessed unless you discipline yourself in the word of God, whereby he has said, if you do thus and thus, I will bless you. You know something? He always keeps his word. If you decide, I, I know a better way. I can do this in the world. Forget it, dear. God won't bless it. And you will end up, when it comes time, nine times out of ten, to truly do that work for God that you were destined to do. You blew it. And you're entangled in the ways of the world with penalties to pay. And you're not going to amount to a hill of beans. You're worthless. Because you didn't practice discipline of freedom within Let's say even your own nation. A nation that will protect you, it will also lock you up if you do not discipline yourselves in the ways of that. You'll lose your freedom. People do it every day. So, nothing new about that slogan. The slogan, freedom cannot prosper without discipline. You don't discipline yourself, you'll lose your freedom in one way or the other. All the way back to, to uh, Plato. All the way back to Attic freedom among the Grecians. Hundreds, thousands of years ago, freedom was truly recognized for what it is. And here we live in a nation that served a motherland in a sense, many of us did, we are a, a, a nation of many people. But in the beginning from Plymouth Rock, the government established a church. And that church governed, basically. And you worshipped what you were told to worship. You practiced what you were told to practice. And you did not have the freedom to teach as you might want to teach unless you enjoyed being preheated uh, or radar ranged at the stake. <laughs> right? It was called heresy and that sort of thing. And you could, you, they would have a um, a picnic and, and roast people <laughs> right and left. Almost messed myself up here. But freedom to teach what you wish to teach from God's Word. But at the same time, you see, many might say, well, then I could start my own religion. No, you couldn't. That's not discipline. You have to discipline yourself in God's Word. You must do it His way, or He cuts off the blessings. Goodbye, Charlie. Lots of luck, smooth sailing, but you're going to sink. It's so simple to enjoy freedom. To, let me let me add one more slogan to this. To truly be free, one must shake off all fears. Of, be able to shake off all fears of death. You'll have to think about that one maybe for a moment. To be totally the only way you can reach total freedom is to be able to shake off all fears of death. Now, I'm not talking about not using common sense. You don't 
Well, I don't have to fear death. I'm driving 100 miles an hour. You're going to kill yourself, fool. Okay? That's not disciplining yourself with rules of the road. Right? But what do I mean by that? That you know what's going to happen to you after death. That you know that we serve a living God and that our freedom far exceeds and extends itself beyond the belt the bounds or the realm of this particular earth age. That we have that freedom with him when we're doing his work. And we need not fear, for he's in control as long as we practice common sense. Okay, I hope you see what I'm saying. There's only one way you can reach that last freedom I suggested, and that is through your Heavenly Father. Through your Heavenly Father. That means disciplining yourself both Politically, and I use that term broadly. I'm, I'm meaning by that discipline yourself within the government that you you live under. That's very important. Let, let's let's touch on that just a moment. Perhaps I'm digressing, be that as it may. I just feel led to. There was a time that we had the Boston Tea Party, and hey, we rebelled against the government that was over us at that time. Was it the price of tea? Not really. It still went back to that church. And the slogans would come forth, give me freedom or give me death. The way you judge disciplining yourself in your government is when the government goes to the point that it will not allow you to function as you know that God intends you to. And then within that realm comes much discipline of being able to even practice covert activity. And I'm, I'm not talking about anything gross or illegal or anything of that nature, but I'm saying of your own personal feelings. You don't, you don't open, you, you, that's when rebellion comes into being is when your rights of these protections I've been speaking of are removed from you. And you are chained whereby you cannot do or discipline yourself in the word of God. Then you have the right to try to break out or whatever in God's eyes. That would There would be so many different cases of that. But I just add that to show you that we're talking about discipline governmentally. I'm going to use that rather than the word political. Governmentally and spiritually. And naturally the spiritual always takes the higher plane. That's where your heart should be. That's where your mind should be. If anyone lays your priorities out or even looks at your life, they can read your mind in that sense. Perhaps that's an oversimplification, but be that as it may, it is true. And it will bear fruit. I can tell you whether someone is going to be successful in serving God by being around them two or three months. It's uh, basically... Roughly, you can tell. Now, how do we then discipline ourselves in God's Word? We study His Word. I want you, if you will, to open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. Let me tell you a little bit about what's happening here. And what we're going to talk about, and I think it behooves us to, is to talk about God's discipline in the prophetic revelation. Let me say that again. It's important that you understand where I'm going now, or you may miss the train. I think it's important that we study Yahweh, our Heavenly Father's disciplines in the prophetic revelation, which is to say that that the prophets told us would come to pass and in a sense, many times has. I will be speaking in the sense of a nation in as much as the ten tribes of Samaria went north over the Caucasus Mountains, or later called Caucasian, settled Europe, many of them later coming to this country, as well as spreading throughout the world and so forth. That government is still in existence. Those people still exist. And many of them don't even know it. Therefore, they do not discipline themselves in the Word of God to practice that discipline. Therefore, if they are not very careful, they will lose their freedom to the Assyrian 
who is always typed in God's word as the false messiah or antichrist. They will lose their freedom to him because they will worship him, thinking they're doing well and good, thinking they are serving God. So in this eighth chapter of Isaiah, we have a prophetic utterance of what would come to pass ultimately, yes, even in the end, and what you should do about it, okay? Um, Isaiah chapter 8, let's pick it up in verse 7. Now, therefore, behold, in other words, he's warning them that they're going into captivity and that the Assyrians are going to overflow them. That is the false teaching, the false messiah in the sense of revelation. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river. What river? Euphrates, the river that is always the dividing line between Satan and God's children, or Babylon and God's children. Strong and many, even the king of Assyria, and all his glory, and he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. This is deception of the end times in that sense. You that are not familiar with it, make a quick mental note or write it down. Isaiah chapter 14 will document for you in your companion Bible that the Assyrian is a type of Antichrist. I say that in passing. Verse 8. And he shall pass through Judah, he shall overflow and go over, he shall reach even to the neck, and the stretching out of his wing shall fill the breath of the land. O Emmanuel. What does the word Emmanuel mean in the Hebrew tongue? God with us. Now, do you have God with you, or do you not? Have you ever read the ninth chapter of Daniel in the 27th verse, whereby it states that in the middle of the week, in the sense of revelation, that the false messiah would come in with outstretched wings of abomination and would take, do away with the sacred communion because they would be taking communion to him, and he would bring in the abomination. Therefore, Christ himself would warn in Matthew 24, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in Jerusalem, you better get out. That's what we're talking about here, my friend. His overspreading wings of deception will take under its protection, which is a bad place to be, those that have not disciplined themselves in the word of God in his Holy Spirit. Associate yourselves, O ye people, and ye shall be broken in pieces, and give ear, all ye of far countries. Gird yourself, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourself, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Multiplied of repetition, whereby you can catch the emphasis. He said you can be as strong as you want in your little earthly attire, but God's going to get you. We don't have to fear God unless we are in the camp of the false one. He's going to destroy it. Quite and simple. You would do well to discipline yourself and your mind to that fact. You can't serve Satan and expect to receive God's blessing in the flesh or anywhere else. Verse 10, take counsel together and it shall come to naught. In other words, you call all the G7 meetings you wish to. You call all the one world systems, one worldism together, and leave God out of it. And what happens? It comes to naught. Speak the word and it shall not stand for God is with us. A repetition of the word in Manuel. Verse 11, for the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand. In other words, he wasn't playing around. He made it very clear. And instructed, underline that word, it means disciplined, instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, that word instructed is, is yashar in the Hebrew tongue. It means even to beat with a stick if you have to, to get the attention. It means to instruct with vigor. That's why he said with a strong arm. And if you don't think God won't chastise you, if you have promised yourself to him and get out of that line, then you've got another thing coming, my dear, because he certainly will. That's part of discipline. It's just like people disciplining their children. 
You get these philosophies. Don't touch them. That's child abuse. The true abuse is not to discipline the child. If you love your child, you will discipline that child. God loves you. So, you better get ready and you better be willing to say, thank you, sir, when he corrects you. In other words, yasa means a little more than when we sat down and had a little church meeting and, and instruction was given. They went around, hey, do you understand that? Do you? <laughs> you got it? All right. <laughs> okay. God wasn't messing around. That's what he's talking about. Point made. Jeff got it long before I got there. Either. Okay. <laughs> Verse 12. Say ye not a confederacy. Let me let me update that. Say ye not one world is of the United Nations. I don't have anything against the United Nations as part of God's plan, but do be careful. Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say, a confederacy, neither fear ye they, their fear, nor be afraid. You don't have to. You're freed from it. That's what true freedom is. But it looks bad out there, brother. That's what God said it would. So, amen, right on. That's exactly the way it's coming to pass, the way he has written it. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear. Reverence better in the Hebrew. Reverence him, not the world. And let him be your dread. In other words, dread not pleasing him whereby you don't have eternal life. Boy, I don't want any of you to die in the lake of fire. That's a spiritual saying, yes. I love you too much for that. I hope you can take instruction from God. Whereby it doesn't even enter or have anything to do with it. 14. And he shall be for a sanctuary. That, you know what? A sanctuary, is that's a place you can go and have safety. Many of you, when you walk into your home after a hard day, whew, boy, you kick your shoes off and lean back. That's your sanctuary. You feel good there, usually. And... Um, you feel safe. You feel safer than you do out in the world. You don't have the pressure of traffic running over you or bad people or anything else. Usually you can just, I'm among my own, I'm comfortable, and so forth. Family. Let God be your sanctuary, and then he, he's with you wherever you are. Back to the play on the word Emmanuel, God with you, all right? You're, be, uh, he shall be for a sanctuary, but but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin, that's to say a trap, and for a snare, another trap, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. In other words, well, how, how could Jesus ever become a stumbling block? It's very simple, my friend. When the Assyrian, that's to say the false Jesus, comes, those that have practiced serving Jesus without getting into the Word to find out there is a true and a false could be a stumbling block because they might listen to someone that says, all you have to do is believe and be saved and just worship and pray without knowing that the false Messiah is coming first, then Christ could be a stumbling block because they want to do right. They don't know any better. If they haven't disciplined themselves and received instruction, then he can very well become a stumbling block. Verse 15, And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. 16, listen carefully. Bind up the testimony. Do you know what the testimony? This word, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. I want you to underline that word disciples and I want you to, when you get home, I want you to look up that word in your Strong's Concordance. It's nimmod. Nimmod. And it means a student. It means to be disciplined in that word. To be disciplined. The word disciple means student. But a student is someone that disciples themselves or disciplines themselves in that that is taught what does it mean then? To discipline yourself means to practice it necessarily. So, and I will wait upon the Lord and hide it, that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Just because he hides himself from those that go astray, beloved, don't you? Now, the answer to this, basically, 
or at least the start of the unraveling of the answer, you'll find in the 28th chapter of this book of Isaiah concerning disciplining yourself whereby you can have freedom both under, in, under this government or any other government in this world and still have freedom of your spiritual beliefs. Turn with me to Isaiah 28. We have the same situation here, whereas God is speaking of that deception in what? In a prophetic sense. What does prophetic mean? Concerning prophecy. What the prophecy says will come to pass in the future. You're in that future, and you'd better be aware of it. Let's start with verse 22 of 28. And let's receive a little more instruction concerning this same subject. Now, therefore, be ye not mockers, lest your bands, your ties, that is, be made strong. In other words, lest you become more in bondage to the world you're living in. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a consumption even determined upon the whole earth. Not just part of it. Not just our nation, but the whole earth. But give ye ear and hear my voice. Hearken and hear my speech. Are you ready to receive some instruction? Listen. Doth the plowman plow all day to sow? Doth he open and break the clods of his ground when he hath made plain the face thereof? Doth he not cast abroad the fitches and scatter the cumin and cast in the principal wheat and the appointed barley and the rye in their place? That is a question. Let me explain it to you. If it loses so much in the translation, you might miss it. What he's saying is, do you set yourself up as a plowman and then you herald that by breaking the clouds up and you say, i got to plow more and go in and plow it all up all over again? Okay? In other words, when you've got the ground smooth, do you just keep plowing? No, that would be stupid. If it's ready to plant, it's ready to plant. So, watch yourself as you discipline yourself in serving God. When you get the ground plowed and ready, plant it. But there's still more wisdom in this that he expects you to take from it. He mentioned several seeds there. Some of them are a little bitty and some of them are for seasonings and some of it's to make bread with. And you got to be very careful because you got to know what to do and how to serve God. That's why listening to someone that says, just believe with all your heart. You don't have to read the book of Revelations. No one can understand it. That's the most stupid statement that anyone could ever make when the word revelation in any language you want to place it in means to uncover or reveal. I scratch my head in wonder. When I hear ministers make that statement, another cliche, don't worry about the Antichrist. When he comes, you're going to be gone. Nowhere is that written in God's word. It's a lie, a big lie. God, quite the contrary, said, don't listen to it and don't get in confederacy with them. You're going to be sucked up in it. He's already told you, I don't care how they arm themselves. I'm going to grind them up. And he means to spiritually defeat them. All right? But that's the meaning. Discipline yourself in doing his work. In other words, let, let's put an analogy to this. And I know this. I'm not talking down to anyone, but just so we really know we understand. We have a good friend. And that friend has been coming over and saying, well, I understand that you know where the dead are. I really need to know. And this person says, well, I've got to get this ground just right. Well, my friend, let's talk about Jesus a minute. Get you prepared here. He comes over the next day. And he said, I understand that you know where the dead are. Well, let's make sure. I don't want to offend you. you know. Let's make sure. Never quite gets around to planting the seed. All right? Okay. Uh, point well made. Verse 26. For his God doth instruct him to discretion. 
and does not disuse me. I thank you for this. Teach him. Now, beloved, does he you? Do you understand discipline? Do you understand discretion? Do you know how to use discretion? It takes common sense. In other words, common sense won't let you go out and plow and harrow the same ground over and over and over. If you don't put seed in it, it's not going to grow. Right? Pretty soon, you're wasting your time. So you do something about it. So he's saying, you listen. Open your mind to me just a little bit. And listen with discretion. 27. For the ditches are not threshed with a threshing instrument, neither is a cartwheel turned about upon the coming. But the ditches are beaten out with a staff and the coming with a rod. In other words, it takes a, it takes a lot more slugging power to get the one seed loose because it's bigger and so forth. Now, but if you go beating the other, it's gone. All right? It'll fly away. You know what your father's saying to you? When it comes to discipline and teaching, sometime to get the harvest I want out of you, this is what is implied. There may be in this, in as much as, as discipline and instruction means, like I was showing you with old Jeff while ago, every once in a while he has to correct you a little bit. Some of you, he may just get by with using the staff on you. And others, he may need to get to the rod, all right? To do a little thrashing to reap some fruit from your labors. Verse 28. Red corn is bruised. How many of you know what cornbread is? All of you do. What do you do with corn? you got to grind it and bruise it. And I mean, just work it over good. How many of you have ever felt that God did you that way? To get you attention. To get you to listen. He really had to bruise you good. All right? Red corn is, crushed, is bruised or crushed because he will not ever be he will not ever be thrashing it, nor break it with the wheel of his cart, nor bruise it with his horsemen. In other words, uh, once it's ground and once it's ground, you don't just keep on pounding it either. Okay, once it's corrected, that's God's promise. Hey, I'm not going to correct you beyond what you need correction. When you get there, when you say, yes, sir, just use me, I thank you for the, for the hint. I'm not going to just go out here and plow all day and never get around to planting, and I'll be very careful to understand there is a difference in each one of us. Some of us need more and some of us need less for discipline, and that's true. There's not a parent in this room that doesn't understand what God's talking about here. We're not the same, and children are not the same. God knows you all are not the same thing. And he promises, I'll only use what is necessary. 29, this also cometh forth from the Lord of hosts, which is wonderful in counsel. Do you know what that says? He said, he's a wonderful teacher. That's what this word counsel means in the Hebrew. And excellent in working. Working what? Working wisdom. Whereby you know how to function with and and in him. Those are some very minor, simple lessons in disciplining yourself to know what God's going to do to you, especially in this prophecy concerning what will happen to our people. They're going to be thrashed, my friend. And thrashing for some is a very simple thing. Anyone that thinks they are perfect and never need a little correcting is probably a dreamer, you know, and they say, ouch, what was that? Oh, you know. They get corrected, and, and sometimes they're not even aware of it. Next time, it'll be harder, okay, and so forth. But very simple. Don't wrestle with it. Now, there is one book that is called Hosea. It lies right after the book of Daniel in your Bible. And the word Hosea it's a lot like the word Jesus, the Greek word. It's a Hebrew word, Hosea, but Jesus is a Greek word. But they mean the same thing, salvation. Well, not actually the whole. Jesus means Yeshua, which is to say Yahweh's Savior. And Hosea simply means uh, Savior. What did God tell Hosea to do? He told him, and this had to do with those tribes that went north and some spreading to the east, he said. Go marry a harlot. Why? Because they had they had left off worshiping him, 
and were worshiping God only knows what. Okay? And they were practicing whoredom in their religion. That, to come to salvation, what is God saying? I still love them. I still love her. And I love her children. I want them back. And he wants you back. He wants you to discipline yourself in him. Okay, let's go to Hosea chapter 7. And we're going to begin with verse 11 to get a better understanding of this than ever before. Ephraim was the larger of the tribes. Therefore, you see when he is mentioned, it means all of those ten. Okay, verse 11 of chapter 7, Hosea, meaning salvation or how you come to your salvation. Ephraim also is like a silly dove without heart. That means he doesn't use his mind a whole lot. They call to Egypt and they go to Assyria. You notice how God has kept that prophecy in tow concerning the Middle East peace talk. You always notice how that Egypt gets called into it before it's over with. Still to this day, okay? still to this day, remember the Camp David people towards Egypt. Egypt can fix it. They're mild and kind of understand us. They'll be able to work it out. All right? And don't forget the Assyrian means the false messiah. All right? Documentation, again, Isaiah 14, your companion Bible will help you. Verse 12. When they shall go, I will spread my net upon them. I will bring them down as the fowls of the heaven. I will chastise them as their congregation hath heard. In other words, those prophetic utterances that I would discipline them, I'm going to do it. 13. Woe unto them, for they have fled from me, destruction upon them, because they have transgressed against me, Though I have redeemed them, yet they have spoken lies against me. Beloved, I'm going to tell you something. Christ paid an awesome price on the cross. There are 17 church buildings in this town. More now, I guess. And I'm going to tell you something. You get a lot of different messages if you were to make that circuit about what you must do to be saved. There's only one way you can know, and that's from here. All right, Not what man says, but from here. 14, and they have not cried unto me with their heart when they howled upon their beds. They assembled themselves for corn and wine, and they rebel against me. When do you rebel against God? Never. You never. You better not ever rebel against God. You better take his discipline again and say, thank you, Father, or you're going to get more, my friend. 15, though I have bound... Though I have bound and strengthened their arms, yet do they imagine mischief against me. And and so it is. And so they do. Verse 16. They return, but not to the Most High. Remember, when they rebel, they go to apostasy. They run to the false one, not the true Father. Verse 16. They return, but not to the Most High. They are like a deceitful bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword for the rage, the insolence of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. In other words, you're never going to get help. I'll at least be that intelligent. May we all at least be that intelligent. If you need help, there's only one that will always love you and never forsake you. And that is God himself. Now, this is basically explained right to its fullest in the 10th chapter of this great book of Hosea, which has to do with salvation. I want you to turn there with me now. You're going to see a lot of prophecy in this that has already come to pass, and I'm going to read it rather rapidly. I'm going to read most of the chapter, most likely. And chapter 10, verse 1 reads, Israel is an empty vine. What does that mean? She's not producing. What do you do with an empty vine in your garden, something that won't produce? You chop it down, all right? He bringeth forth fruit unto himself according to the multitude of his fruit. He hath increased the altars 
according to the goodness of his land. They have made goodly images. A lot of good-looking church houses, but you don't hear too much about God. I love them. They're, they mean well, but there's, there's no excuse when you have the Word. Their heart is divided. In other words, you can hear a different story maybe in every place. This can translate from uh, Hebrew, their mind's crazy. I mean, that's the way God talks. They're, they're, they're crazy. They, they won't discipline themselves in the Word. Now shall they be found faulty. He shall break down their altars. He shall spoil their images. When the false one comes, that is exactly what shall happen. For now they shall say, We have no king, because we feared not the Lord. What then should a king do to us? What, what good is a king, or what can a king do for us? Let me tell you something. The day that the king of kings and lord of lords walks this earth, they're going to find out what a king can do for them. They have spoken words swearing falsely and making a covenant. Many covenants go around. The G7 is meeting in Japan today. Well, don't expect too much, all right? Thus, judgment or litigation Bringeth up as hemlock. You know what hemlock is? It's poison. In the furrows of the field, the poppy grows. Five, the inhabitants of Samaria shall fear because of the calves of Beth of Then. Now, many of you might have thought because I was using churches, I was reading something into this. Do you know what Beth of Then is in Hebrew? House of nothing. Do you know what Bethel? It's a word that is a play on Bethel, which is the house of God. Instead of being a house of God, it's the house of naught. Nothing. Let me ask you a question. You're really intelligent people. What can you expect to gain from a house of nothing? Answer me. Nothing. You know? Nothing. Really? You know, it's tough to figure those things out, but, you know, here we go. Calves of Bethaden, for the people thereof shall mourn over it, and the priest thereof that rejoice own it, for the glory thereof, because it is departed from it. Now, you better know what that word priest is in the Hebrew before you get too carried away there. It's a black priest. It's a, ba- it's a Kimmerin. Kimmerin. This is a Baal priest. Don't catch yourself following one of them, friends. Verse 6. It shall be also carried into Assyria for a present to King Jareb. Now, let, let, let me give you a little... I'm, I, I was going to just read this real fast. What is Jareb in the Hebrew tongue? Adversary. Then pray tell me... I mean, it's calling King er, uh, Jareb, the Assyrian. Who is... The Assyrian is a type for Antichrist, which is to say Satan. Who's the adversary? That's what Jerob means in the Hebrew tongue. It's Satan, of course. The Antichrist. Ephraim shall, re- that's the Gentile tribe, shall receive shame, and Israel shall be ashamed of his own counsel. Man, I'll tell you what. How many of you listen to our counsel today? You know, on this Meet the Press and all these things, you know what the high topic is today? Will we let homosexuals in our armed forces? I mean, really heavy stuff, you know, really. Not, is our armed forces, are our armed forces capable of carrying out their obligations of protecting this nation and disciplining us? Really heavy counsel. I'm kind of ashamed of their counsel, especially when I see certain ones that is against God's way appointed to some of the highest offices in this nation. How can you ask God's blessing? You better get used to not having them on the nation because they're going to fly away, my friend, if it, if they continue in the way they're going. That's one of the things I'm reading this for. Freedom without discipline cannot be. As a for Samaria, her king is cut off as the foam upon the water. You know what that means? You know how the white waves are chopping along pretty good, and you see them white, see those white caps out there, lots of them. You know, 
And then she flattens out and there's nothing. Nothing. The high place is also a, a vent. Now, just all it's got is the Beth off of it, all right? Beth means house in the Hebrew tongue. Again, what does a then mean then? I told you, nothing, naught. Naught and naught is naught, all right? That's real ciphering, all right? Now, the sin of Israel shall be destroyed. The thorn and the thistle shall come up on their altars. Spiritually speaking, yes. And they shall say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. You all know from the book of Revelation when that line comes to pass, it's when they wake up when the true Christ returns and realize for a moment they worship the false Jesus. They don't want to live because of their shame. Stay real sharp for me. we got some heavy stuff coming up here. Nine, O Israel, thou hast sinned from the days of Gibeah. There they stood. The battle in Gibeah against the children of iniquity did not overtake them. Do you all know what happened at Gibeah? You should. Gibeah is where this Levitical priest was traveling through with his young wife in, in a town of Benjamin. And they came up and said, hand out that man. We want to know him. They were perverts. A bunch of perverts trying to grab out a man who was under the protection of another Levite's authority. No discipline. Just about where you are today, my friend, when you have the children of iniquity. Do I love them? We've got a lot of students with us that have been perverts, and some still are, that still study with us. Some of them have come out of it. Some of them are, do not, they no longer practice. And unfortunately, many, not just a few, but many, have written that they have AIDS. And if they had known us ten years ago, they would not have AIDS today. So don't think I'm talking about individuals. I'm talking about a condition and a state in which this world is at this time. Gibeah is upon us. Verse 10. It is in my desire that I should chastise them. You know what God's desire is? Get ready for it, my friends. You're reading tomorrow's newspaper, all right? God's going to punish them. And the people shall be gathered against them when they shall bind themselves in their two furrows. You know what the two furrows most likely originally come from, but it's two thoughts, two Christianities, the true Christianity and the false. It all started with two calves. You know why two calves? Because the ten tribes were a long way from Jerusalem. And old Joabom, King Joabom said, I want to make it easy for you. I want to give you some instant religion. We're going to make two golden calves and you can worship right here at Samaria where you don't have to make the long trip to Jerusalem. Just one thing wrong with that. God hates it. When he says do something, I don't care how long the path is, do it. All right? Do it. Discipline yourself in doing it his way. Now, today you have a strong discipline in Christianity. You have a strange world, period. You live in a nation. How is it practicing its, its, uh, uh, it's almost, I call it, it is still a Christian nation. But there are certain officials that are anti-Christian already. Example. Not, I was, I have never been a follower of Jim Baker. I've never had anything against him either. Uh, other than, you know, um, he, he didn't teach too much word and did a lot of whatever else. I don't know. I never really watched him. But I resented highly. When he was taken so-called prisoner, that that so-called Christian, and I'm not going to judge the man, I'm sure he is a Christian, was shackled and chained. And what a miserable sight he was as he walked out of his place. And I know most of you have seen that on television. What happened this week? 
when a Muslim leader, preacher, a sheikh, shook up all of New York, a group that was going to paralyze uh, Staten Island, would that be the place, by blowing up the tunnel? And God only knows what else. Already the trade building. He would surrender if he could do it with dignity. And your government allowed it. You know, away with him. You know, there's only one place for him. Well, if you incarcerate him, dump that sucker in Egypt. All right? Get rid of him. We have to practice more discipline in a godly way. But it is a disgrace. Again, as far as I'm concerned, Jim Baker was not a criminal in the sense of being dangerous. And that's what you usually use shackles for. What put shackles on him? He was a Christian. I guarantee you one thing. I pray it never comes to pass. But if you ever see your pastor shackled, I'll wear them with pride. I'll walk out with them on in pride. It will not be in humiliation. I, again, don't. I, that's not a prophecy because I, <laughs> I trust that I've disciplined myself enough in the Word you say that you don't get yourself to that point. You know, you bring your own misery on yourself. Now, but you are living in an age where the forces of Satan through the media and other devices scream to the high heaven if it's, if it's on someone's rights, whether it be the gay community or this religion or that religion, but God help the Christians because you're going to get it. All right? That's just the way it is. All right. Now, the two furrows, the two ways of belief. Eleven. And Ephraim is as an heifer that is taught. Now, now sharpen up what is taught. It means it has been educated. And love us to tread out the corn. In other words, what happened when, when a heifer got to tread the corn? That was thrashing. You say, boy, you can eat all you want. That was the way it went. The easy job. But I passed over her, uh, I passed over upon her fair neck. I will make Ephraim to ride. You know what he's saying there? I'm going to scatter her. To ride means she's going a long way. She did. The migrations of those ten tribes have covered a lot of, God said, I'm going to scatter her. Now sharpen that for me because that's what this is all about. You're going to find the answer. Judah shall plow, and Jacob shall break his clods. We're back again to that. Now, listen carefully. Twelve. Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. You reap in love. Break up your fallow ground. Now, what did he say before? Use common sense. Don't just that's all you do. But I want you to listen to a little different advice he's giving you because there are different kinds of people. And that's the whole point. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time. Time for what? It is time to seek the Lord till or until he come and rain righteousness upon you. In other words, you keep plowing and you keep breaking up the fallow ground. But, beloved, if you ever learn any one thing, you're not going to get past that point. You're not going to get past breaking up the foul, the foul of ground until God comes and rains righteousness upon you. You understand that? You plant all the seeds you want to. They're going to rot in the ground. You do all this you want to, and they're going to blast in the field. It's not going to do you any good until God comes and rains do you get the, the latter, or former rain and the latter rain? I could do so much with this, but I feel that I, I might be, it might be confusing. Well, what is God going to rain on us? Righteousness. What's that? That, that is right. Well, how do you get it when you deserve it? God will never mistreat you. God will never punish you nor correct you unless you need it. 
But you must, listen to me carefully, you must discipline yourself in that vein. Keep plowing. That means don't give up. Keep trying. And, but, in other words, let me ask you a question. If you go out here and you break up a piece of ground and you plant some seed, who makes it grow? Do you? And if you go out there and plow all you want to and plant it until it gets moisture, what's it going to do? It's going to lie dormant. What am I saying? You can't do anything without God. You, you are nothing without God's blessings. How did you get it? Through discipline. He, did he not say, I correct you, I teach you. He has taught you how to plant. We've been all through it this morning. Now it's time for him to rain righteousness which will germinate the seed you have planted. But you've got to be right in doing it. You can't, you can't be over in this other furrow. You can't stand straddle-legged in both furrows and expect your seed to come up. It's not going to do it. You've got to be disciplined in him and him alone. And then he will begin to bless you. Let's, let's go on with this just a little bit further. Verse 13. Ye have plowed wickedness and you have reaped iniquity. You understand what you're going to get if you don't do it his way? Ye have eaten the fruit of lies because thou didst trust in their way, thy way in the multitude of thy mighty men. Men can't help you, beloved. Well, I can't help you. God helps you. God opens your mind and reigns upon that mind whereby the real truth that is set there when you just keep plowing opens that door and that that is right comes into your mind and that that is wrong you're able to ascertain and kick it out and hang to that way which receives his blessings. Therefore shall a tumult arise among the people and all the fortresses shall be spoiled at Shalman. That's fire worshippers is what that word means. Spoiled, spoiled Beth Arbel. That's the house of the ambush of God. All right? You want to be ambushed by God? Do it your way, friend. In the day of battle, the mother was dashed in pieces upon her children. So shall Beth El. What is Beth El? The house of God. The true one. So shall Beth El do unto you because of your great wickedness in a morning one morning, you might say, shall a king of Israel utterly be cut off. Why? One world is not Why? One morning, Christ is returning. One day. And you're going to have that proof. What is your final instruction? I hate to quit without reading one or two verses in the New Testament. Turn with me to 2 Timothy. This is a doctrinal book. 2 Timothy in chapter 3. And for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and start reading in chapter 3. Verse 13, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 2 Timothy 3.13 2 Timothy 3.14 But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Do you? the Holy Spirit that learned, that you have learned them of. Because if a teacher teaches it and you can receive it, it is the Holy Spirit, God, reigning righteousness into your mind whereby your priorities are set in order. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. Many of you, since you've been a small child, you've known there was more to the Holy Scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Listen carefully with discipline in your mind. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, to teach, for reproof, for, for correction. We, you get your part of it. For instruction, there again, discipline in righteousness 
that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good work. Can't stop there. Got to go two more verses. I charge thee before, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. You understand that's a play on planting. Do you plant in December? Do you plant uh, corn in December? No, of course not. Use a little common sense. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, meaning only to teach those things that are pleasing to man. Beloved, it is far easier to teach on those things that are praiseworthy. That's just all praise in this. And you can just have a great time just in praising the Lord, and that's all you do is praise. But a true teacher must teach the Word as it is written. And he or she must be capable of withstanding the flack or the itching ears saying things they don't like to hear. There are many things I teach that, that sting me bad. Why? I'm a sinner. All right? We all sin in one way or the other. I'm not a real bad sinner. Don't look shocked, okay? I'm maybe not as bad as some of you, but anyway, we won't start. We won't start comparing cards here, okay? Uh, it might be embarrassing, but anyway, God corrects us and and leads us. So therefore, don't be afraid to teach everything that is written in God's Word. You know. Real quickly, I'm going to share something. When I first received, I'm going to just use it in that terminology, the Word. This, this is awesome and it's different, Father, than anything. I've, I haven't heard anybody teach this. How much of this do I teach? And my attention was drawn to up. You can believe this or not believe it. I do not teach this as gospel, all right? And there was a huge white book up over my head like this. And it was, uh, where's the song book? I don't want to do that to one of your Bibles because if it's like mine, I would lose notes to glory. It was white and it was like this up over my head. And the pages real evenly started falling until only the back stood out. All of it. If you're going to teach any of it, teach all of it. Whether it stings you or somebody else. It is for reproof. It is for instruction. It is whereby we may discipline ourselves. There, you want to sing another one? There. And it is for correction. And whereby we can discipline ourselves in our daily lives, both in the community, in our personal family, and don't forget to discipline your children. But most of all, discipline yourself. Make certain that your priorities or in order, because people can read your hearts and minds. Okay? Real easy. But most of all, it doesn't really matter that people can read your mind. God can. And it hurts Him sometimes when we let Him go. So, freedom without discipline cannot flourish. Don't forget to pray for your nation on this Independence Day. Secondly, thank God that you live in this hemisphere whereby we have been able, allowed to practice so much of that freedom. Father, we thank you for the privilege of gathering together. Be with us this day. Be with these traveling. Father, watch over them. We ask it in Yeshua's precious name. Amen.